Simon Schlomo Khan. SK Schlomo. SK I'm getting 
ahead of myself. Do you guys want to go from the, from the beginning? Should we start the show properly, everybody? I said, should we start the show proper? All right, guys, I want to tell you a story. I realized I was a performer at a very early age to the point where my mum says she has video footage of me aged three years old, belly dancing at my grandmother's party. I can explain. When I was a kid, there was quite a big Iraqi Jewish community based in North London. And my nana, she used to host these huge parties. Nana, uh, she's about this tall. Her real name's Julie. And if you ever hear this sound, you know, it's going to be a very good night. Okay? So that's Nana. She's kind of intense, which is why you should meet the antidote. Like the polar opposite of my Nana is my grandpa over here. This is Grandpa Josh. He just sits here in his chair for hours at a time, radiating happiness and clicking on his worry beads. Worry beads, if you don't know what that is, it's like a string of beads that old Middle Eastern men carry around to like pass the time and alleviate their stresses about the camels or whatever. <laughs> So I remember one of my earliest childhood memories sitting watching whilst Grandpa Josh used to play this one rhythm over and over again on a small little Arabic drum called a dumbo. Let me show you the rhythm. Go like this. So Nana's parties, we'd always get there first and you know something's gonna happen because all the chairs are laid out around the outside of the room and the moment you cross the threshold, you can smell the food. Oh my gosh, guys, the Arabic food is to die for. And then your aunties start arriving. For some reason, there are hundreds of these ancient women who call themselves your auntie and every single one of them wants to queue up to pinch your cheeks as hard as she possibly can and tell you that you're the most beautiful human being who ever lived, which after a while, you do start to believe. <laughs> And then the band starts playing. There's always a proper Arabic band. Let me show you the sound. That's how I remember it anyway. There might have been a few less prodigy beats in there. I don't know. <laughs> 
change. So yeah, guys, like from such an early age, I realized performing, it was part of my identity. I understood that from like three years old. If I projected a big enough, happy enough, positive enough persona, people would love me more. It was amazing. And you know what? I believed those aunties telling me that I was beautiful, telling me that I was center of the world because I was center of that world, rich with color and rhythm and imagination until I got to British primary school. <laughs> where we were the only immigrant family. And I was four years old and I knew, I was painfully aware that we were different. You know what I mean? I felt like an outsider for quite a long time. Until I was eight, when my parents accidentally gave me my superpowers. You know what happened? For my eighth birthday, they bought me a drum kit. But you know what they said? They said, son, happy birthday. Your dreams have come true. We've bought you a drum kit. But please don't practice. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to practice between all these different hours of the day in case it would annoy the neighbours. And that's when I started experimenting with vocal rhythm sounds. Do you guys want to hear some of the noises I was making when I was eight years old? You don't sound that bothered. Do you guys want to hear some of the noises I was making when I was eight years old? Alright, let me show you. So I start simple like... <laughs> in the morning I'm gonna chase him out of earth <laughs> Big disgrace, moving your banner out over the place. Hey, you're a boy, make a big noise, playing in the street. 
big disgrace Living your mind all over the place Are you a boy, make a big noise Playing in the street, gonna be a big man Someday you got mud on your face Big disgrace, waving your banner all over the place But are you a boy, make a big noise Playing in the street, gonna be a big man Someday you got mud on your face Big disgrace, waving your banner all over the place But are you a boy, make a big noise Playing in the street, gonna be a big man Someday you got mud on your face Big disgrace, waving your banner all over the place But are you a boy, make a big noise Playing in the street to that question, but that's a different matter. <laughs> so yeah, this is Beast. It's kind of it's a one-man show, but it's kind of one man and one machine, and she's really powerful. She can do lots of stuff. Like, yeah, let's play some piano. <laughs> Is that right? Is everyone good? Yeah. Everyone got everything they need? Everyone want, anyone need a glass of water? Peppermint tea? No? You're okay. Good. All right. <laughs> Let's get back to the story. So by this time, I am now world looping champion. I've built an international audience and I'm super driven. My music comes first. Above my family, above my friends. I just toured the whole time. Missed all their weddings. And I was playing festivals, like main stages, thousands of people, collaborating with people like Ed Sheeran, Damon Albarn, Bjork, Jarvis Cocker, Lily Allen, breaking world records in the process. But despite these accolades, I never felt good enough. Like I needed to be better. obsessed with innovation, but every new broken barrier left me feeling even more hungry to find that ultimate achievement that would finally calm my unrest until there was only one ambition left. Because whilst I love all the vocal acrobatics and the looping and all this, deep down I wanted to be seen as more than that. I wanted to be a singer, songwriter, producer, recording artist. I wanted to sing the songs of my own, but I'd always let life get in the way, which is code for feeling I wouldn't be good enough to do it.
crack and my insides start spilling out.
about mental health, but after a few weeks of feeling like I couldn't fight this incoming tidal wave, I was finally ready to admit that I wasn't okay. First to myself, then to my partner, and after lots of loving encouragement and false starts, I managed to speak to a doctor. The doctor refers me for therapy. In the months that followed, I worked so hard to try and pull myself up and out of this darkness. To try and just rebuild something. But this depression had me hiding away for almost a whole year. Writing my truth into my songs. Isolated by the shame of this secret suffering. I was making an album. I didn't know what to do because none of my family or my friends, and certainly not my fans, had any idea that I'd been struggling. But all these songs I was writing were about my mental health. I was terrified that if the word got out, I'd be seen as weak or unsuccessful or unreliable. I thought it would destroy my career. But I figured if I'm going to make progress with this music, I'm going to have to be honest. So I decided it was time to come out of hiding and I launched a crowdfunding campaign with a video talking openly about my mental health for the first time. And that was frightening, but it was empowering. I immediately started getting messages from all over the world from people who could relate. The total zoomed up to 15%. Now I had been warned I would need a thick, thick skin, so I had been practicing, refining, simplifying my story, working out what I felt comfortable to talk about and what I needed to keep private until I'd found what felt like a safe way to be vulnerable. But nothing could prepare me for what happened next. One day, a few weeks into my campaign, I woke up to a barrage of angry messages from somebody on Twitter claiming to be one of my fans but attacking me about my mental health. He told me I needed to see how low I had stooped. He told me that depression and specifically suicide are evolution's way of weeding out inadequate men who aren't fit to reproduce, who aren't fit to be fathers. Now, I know that online abuse affects many people every day, but this hit me hard. It hit me hard because my mind decided to join in the attack. You are worthless. You are nothing. You are an embarrassment to your family, to your children. You don't deserve to live. Looking back, I know this kind of anxiety is all too common. These feelings amplified within the artificial walls of social media it's like the echo chamber for all our insecurities it's like the noise drowns out all reason and so i felt myself drowning plunging into terror i couldn't think straight i couldn't breathe i kept having these frightening intrusive thoughts i wanted to end it i wanted to end it all It, it helped me 
me see. I didn't have to attack myself or isolate myself if I didn't feel good enough to live. Zooming out, I could see how much I still had left to live for. That online message saved my life. Because it helped me change my attitude towards myself. From helpless victim, worthless piece of shit, to empowered human. Do you want to hear one of the songs from the album? Yeah. Thank you. Also, I'm sorry for shouting in your faces and knocking your hat off. That was so rude. I'm sorry. I'm going to do a song for you now. It's called Look Away. I wrote this not long after all of this. And uh, for me, like, this tune is about recovery. Because I realised recovery would mean having to learn to stop running from the pain. It felt like I'd used every addiction I could find to self-medicate, to try and blot it out from alcohol, drugs, overworking, overeating, compulsive use of the internet. None of them can heal the pain. And the truth is, that pain would never heal unless I paused the chaos for long enough to take a look at what it was I was running from, which for me was my trauma. Turns out, I've been trying to forget this memory of being four years old, stuck at the top of the stairs, curled up with my knees to my forehead, with the pain in my stomach, so excruciating, I couldn't make a sound. I couldn't call for help. Even just thinking about that trauma had been too painful for like 30 years. Until, through my music, I was able to create this new persona, this alter ego, who I call Silver, right? Silver's just me, but he's a bit older and he's a lot wiser. He's inside me, he's in my breath, he's in my spirit. This song is about how Silver taught my inner four-year-old to stop running away, to pause, breathe deep, surrender, look the fear in the eye. And so in this song, Silver takes my hand, and this time, we go back to the place I'm most afraid of, back to the top of the stairs, together.
somebody say, oh my gosh. Somebody say, ooh. 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 Yeah, yeah. Somebody say, ah. 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 Ooh. 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 ah. That's why like, uh, somebody say, like, yeah. 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 I said that one night and actually there was an actual choir. Are you actually in fucking choir? Oh, he is. You, you're, you're in one man choir. There is a sort of a choir, I mean, there's like a, bo a, a beatboxing group here, isn't there? Have you, anyone here, have anyone here gone to see Frankenstein? It's the second highest reviewed show in the whole fucking fringe by BAC Beatbox Academy. A few of those guys are in here tonight. I'm with you tomorrow, aren't I? I'm performing with them tomorrow at the Traverse Theatre. I'm really proud of these guys. I helped them found this company 10 years ago, right? No, nearly 11 years ago. BAC Beatbox Academy. If you haven't seen it, it's amazing. I'll stop plugging that now. Get up in my show. <laughs> Give up for those guys. A little round of applause. <laughs> Okay, we've got one slot left here. What do you guys feel like putting into this? It's down to you. What do you want to scream? What do you want to shout? Love mercy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you can choose which one of those two. We'll have half and half. One half of you can go. Ah yeah. The other half can go. Lord of mercy. You ready? Three, two, one. Lord of mercy. <laughs> Amazing. Make some noise for yourselves, guys. You've been awesome tonight. Thank you so much. Oh, shit. That's cool. Yeah, I feel like after this whole thing happened, like something changed inside me. I found like, I found my spirit. And I just want to kind of uh, thank you guys, really, for being listening tonight. Just letting me tell my story. It feels amazing just to be able to be real, be open. And it's been a real journey, as I'm sure you can tell, but I wouldn't change. I wouldn't change any of it because I'm so glad I decided to be open because since I did, my world really has transformed. People, they look at me in the eye now. They're not afraid to be real. And it turns out that my community around me was ready to transform as well. I get messages all the time. People are like, you know, they're now open. They're now able to share issues they've previously been too ashamed to. Several people have come to get professional help after hearing this story. I'm so proud of that. One lady has signed up to become a mental health professional after watching this show. And I can't tell how proud I am. And you know what? As for me, I just feel different. Like, I feel so much less isolated. But like, even when my issues come back to haunt me, I feel like I'm understood. And the main reason is because I've realized something, which is you can't keep dancing for somebody else's love. It doesn't matter how big the stage is, how many thousands of people are there, you're still going to feel empty. You've learned how to love yourself from the inside and that includes the bits that you're ashamed of. So I'm not saying we all have to do this, we don't all need to go and broadcast our deepest, darkest insecurities on the internet. That is not the answer to our suicide epidemic. But in order for us all to feel safe enough to share our setbacks way before they grow into these shameful, destructive secrets, I feel like we can all take small steps towards vulnerability. So if you, like me, believe that can help us together become stronger and safer as a community, I invite you to try something. Try sharing one small truth today, or maybe a big truth. It's up to you. Like, maybe you lost your call in a tricky situation. Or maybe you shouted at your kid. Or maybe you ate all your friend's biscuits. Or maybe there are some days when you can't get out of bed in the morning. Either way, by sharing what's really happening in your head today, you might help somebody else speak their truth tomorrow. And who knows, 
you might save a life. Thank you so much. You're an absolutely beautiful bunch of people. You fucking rule. I'm SK Shlomo. Thank you for listening to me. And I really do mean it from my heart. Like, I can't tell you how it feels. Like, I couldn't do what I loved for nearly two years. I was off the road. I couldn't perform. I couldn't come and communicate with human beings like you. And uh, I just want to tell you how proud I am of something, right? I've been on the tour, but I've been back out on the road, basically, since February. The album came out in March. They've been playing that on Radio 1. I've done a TED talk about this whole journey. Uh, and that whole tour sold out. And then I got to play on the other stage at Glastonbury a few weeks ago. And I just can't tell you how proud I am. So I just want to say thank you to you and everybody else who supported me. I'm really, really proud. So thank you so much. Thank you. And, uh, even though Pledge Music, you might have heard this on the news, Pledge Music, the crowdfunding website, fucked us over, along with, along with all their other clients. They sold the company and they like, lost everybody's money. So we didn't get any of that money, but uh, we still managed to make this album and I'm really proud of it. This is called Surrender. I never planned to make an album about mental health, but here it is. And if you guys wanna uh, support me to continue raising mental health awareness, if you buy a physical copy, then you'll be supporting this incredible charity called Young Minds. Um, you can also get it online. Does anyone here listen to like uh, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, anything like that? Please, please check it out on there. Follow me on there. I'm SK Shlomo. The album is called Surrender. You've already heard a lot of the songs from it tonight. Uh, we've also got uh, on sale today these t-shirts with the artwork on. If you like cats, anyone here like cats? I say that at my kids' show in the daytime and all the kids are like, oh, mommy, mommy, me, me. <laughs> So these are beautiful. If you want one of these, we're selling them in the box office just out there. Um, and again, that will be supporting the charity. If you haven't got any money, just come and say hi to me. I can sign you a ticket, I can sign you a face, or you can put your email into my tablet here and then you'll be on my mailing list and I'll send you a free song from that album. We can stay in touch and be best friends forever. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't feel like this show is over yet. There's one last missing piece of the puzzle, and that is the celebration. So I want to ask you something. Do you feel like you can celebrate? I feel like all this shit affects all of us and it might affect someone that you know it's definitely affected me it might have affected yourself but if we try and push that shit down and pretend it's not there it just gets bigger and badder and darker but the minute that we look at it and say hey you're part of me let's celebrate it loses all of its power so i want to ask you a question do you guys feel like celebrating with me right here right now yeah. that's a good answer let me ask you this what noise do you make when you celebrate can you make that as loud as you can after three one two three
about this rave, which is that you're all standing in front of a chair. So we need to fix that as quickly as you can. Let's crowdsource this as quick as you can. You've got to move the chairs to the back of the room and come back to the front. Are you ready? We're going to build up another track for you. This is called Stardust. Goes like this.